And Tim, you mentioned that the economy continues to rebound from the we'll call it the pandemic-driven recession. But the road has, has been a bit bumpy recently as the Delta variant has put a dent again in industries like travel and entertainment. Let's start with your, your thoughts from a from a 10,000-foot view of GDP and, and the current state of the economy. Sure. Yeah. So in, in the last several quarters, I think, you know, in the last year and a half, any assessment of the economic environment um, and consequently the markets really has to start and end with a pandemic. And so, you know, this chart that we'll show here, you know, shows the seven-day moving average of new confirmed cases in the U.S. and around the globe. And after seeing cases fall sharply in the spring as the initial wave of Americans were vaccinated, daily cases rose to about 150,000 uh, per day in early September, uh, meaningfully uh, rising after seeing the daily average slide to about 12,000 at the end of June. And so thankfully, cases have begun uh, to peak recently. It's largely expected this trend will continue given more widespread immunity and prior infections. And it's now estimated that roughly 85 percent of the U.S. population has at least some immunity to the COVID-19 virus. And um, certainly while the pandemic is not over yet, I think many parts of the economy have adapted to operate in this pandemic environment. And whether we see it fade or not, um, I think it's fair to say that it'll be certainly less disruptive to not just the U.S. economy, but the global economy in the next two years as it, as it was in the prior. And so, you know, as I think I mentioned in prior calls um, and then shared some slides in the past, the, the last economic expansion that we saw that you know, started in the end of the global financial crisis was the longest in U.S. history. And this was, you know, following you know, and of course, then we had the, the deepest recession, you know, since World War II take place last year with output falling by about 10 percent in the first half of the year. And so, you know, thanks to the tremendous monetary and fiscal policy stimulus, you know, output has um, certainly rebounded very, very quickly, uh, very much has been a V-shaped recovery. And now GDP, uh, so the goods and services that, you know, our country produces is now recovered to, you know, levels that we saw in the fourth quarter of 2019 and on track to return to trend growth uh, in the 20 years preceding the pandemic. And so, you know, while growth has certainly been slowing uh, compared to year-over-year -year increases that we saw in the first and second quarter, economic growth continues to be strong both in absolute and relative terms. Um, we expect the U.S. economy to fully recover from the pandemic as we enter the new year. As I mentioned, from a GDP perspective, it already has, but we haven't necessarily seen that full recovery take place in other areas such as the labor market. Um, and I think as you know, looking at the global economy and beyond the next few months, we're also expecting that the global economic environment, not just the U.S., may also be looking uh, very favorable for investors. And the Organization of Economic Cooperation Development, or the OECD, uh, forecasts every one of the major 45 major economies will grow next year, uh, but about half will experience slower growth than we saw in 2021. And so, um, you know, just looking at year over year, global growth is expected to be near about 20 percent, or excuse me, 6 percent um, in 2021. And wouldn't that be nice? And um, <laughs> we'll decelerate slightly, you know, to 5 percent next year. But um, and that's according to the, the IMF. But, you know, this is the fastest growth rate we've seen since 1973. It's the last time global growth was 6 percent or higher. And um, it's very rare to see, you know, global growth exceed, you know, 4% two years in a row, not 20% before. So. Right. <laughs> well, let, let's stay on labor market for a second. The last quarter uh, in September marked the end of the, the enhanced unemployment benefits, which is seen to have a notice, noticeable impact on labor force participation. What are your thoughts on the labor market as, as we're heading into the winter? Yeah, yeah. As I, 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 um, I guess briefly just mentioned, you know, the surge in GDP has almost equaled, you know, the, the rebound in the labor market, um, which really improved, you know, pretty significantly last quarter in particular. And uh, again, just to you know, kind of take a trip down memory lane, and, and I promise we'll stop talking about this at some point. But you know, the U.S. economy shed over 22 million jobs in February, March, and April of last year. And fortunately, we've recovered almost 80 percent through the last jobs report. Um, at the end of August, we saw 77 percent of the jobs uh, lost be recovered, or about 17 million. Busy day tomorrow. We we'll get jobs report for September, um, and payrolls data looked pretty strong for ADP. Uh, today and so, you know, hopefully, we'll continue to see the labor market improve and the uh, U.S. consumer remain on a, a very positive uh, trajectory. Um, again, you know, incomplete uh, recovery though. Unemployment rate is 5.2 percent, and we we're at a generational low, about three and a half percent before the pandemic. So, a little bit of ways to go. Um, the labor market has been slower. 
um, as you mentioned, and, and has been constrained by things like the extended or enhanced unemployment benefits. Uh, but there's also uh, been the contention of, you know, lower rates of immigration, which you know, the U.S. economy has been struggling with for years. We've had lingering fears about the pandemic and many American workers not feeling comfortable to reenter the labor market. Um, and, of course, child care has been very difficult. Um, and so looking ahead, I think it's very important to watch just how quickly this labor market reaches full employment and gets closer to that three and a half, four percent level. And members of the, the Federal Reserve Open Market Committee or the, the Fed or the FOMC uh, are estimating that the unemployment rate will reach about four percent by the end of next year. And it's a really important issue and a very important thing to watch because ultimately a competitive labor market will drive higher wage growth and in return, you know, a greater likelihood for more sustained levels of higher inflation as opposed to what I think we're going through right now, which I anticipate will be uh, transitory, but perhaps a little longer transitory than we expected. Yeah. And, and uh, I'm going to move back to, to take a step back to inflation. The, the latest year over year gain in CPI is at 5.2% overall and, and 4% excluding food and energy. Uh, I've been saying transitory, but I've been hearing transitory for longer recently as evidenced by the FOMC comments. What's the yep. investment committee's take on inflation? Sure. I mean, haven't you heard it enough from the media already? They have it all figured right. out, right? <laughs> um, just you know, talking about those headline numbers, but yeah, you know, that's what drives eyeballs, the, the, the news articles and, and into the TV screen. But I'm kidding. But, um, you know, there's no doubt that inflation has definitely heated up significantly this year, as we've seen, you know, both surging consumer demand, which was a direct you know, result from stimulus. And I think we showed personal income low earlier, where we saw personal income levels really accelerate as stimulus flowed through to the American consumer. But as that um, <clears throat> spending you know, took place and flowed through the economy, it was income that was coming back into the door you know, every single week, every single month. And so we've seen things you know, moderate quite a bit. Um, the other element has been supply chain. And you know, we've definitely seen you know, supply, chain, supply chain shortages uh, across major sectors of the economy. Um, again, here in the U.S. and globally. But I think it's important to keep in mind that you know, year-over-year gains have been amplified by price declines that took place as a result of the pandemic recession from 19 to 20. And you know, as we you know, let's say you know, anecdotally look at um, you know, tickets to Florida for you know, the winter, maybe you know, normally it costs $200. And last year, to demand being low, you know, the airline decided to uh, lower the cost of that ticket to $150. And, and now it's back to 200, which was pre-pandemic levels. Well, that's a 33% increase flowing into the inflation data. And so, you know, a lot of what I think is helpful is considering inflation data from today, looking back to 2019, and zooming out even more and looking at how um, meaningfully inflation um, had under um, performed, you know, compared to what the Fed was expecting over the last market cycle. And, and that's really some of the comments we've you know heard from the Fed that you know ultimately you know these long run inflation expectations um, captured by the Fed's index of you know common inflation they're well anchored and they've only just really reversed the last cycle's damaging decline and and Fed Chair Jerome Powell really downplayed you know the measures of short term inflation expectations uh, including the New York Fed's three year look ahead measure and so you know one of the things I, I think it's important to know too is. You know, CPI numbers are important, but the PCE or personal consumption expenditures is really the preferred measure of the Fed. And while that measure is up 4% year over year, which is quite a bit less, obviously about 20% less than CPI, um, it's still above the long-term target of 2%. And so, you know, again, last month, you know, Powell stuck with the strong message that high inflation will largely be transitory and that, you know, again, these inflation expectations remain uh, well anchored. And so you know, start to see imaginations run wild a little bit. Again, I, I think a lot of this uh, is just driven by just the sensitivity of American consumers towards you know going to the supermarket and seeing meat prices be up pretty significantly. Um, but the likelihood of stagflation or permanently higher inflation is still very, very low, full stop. It, it, it's very low. And so yeah. I think these supply chain disruptions will be ironed out. I think demand growth will, will cool. Uh, with less stimulus slashing around the economy, and I think supply chain disruptions are, are pushing inflation a little bit longer ahead, or excuse me, a little higher um, and longer than expected. But we do expect them to fade as we you know, go into the, the new year and beyond. 